Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another session of the Option Industry Council's webinar series. Uh, my name is Mark Benziquin, and I am the manager on the Investor Services team. And uh, Marty's going to be talking about a concept today called the poor man's covered call. And though we don't want to disparage those investors uh, that uh, have limited funds to uh, invest in options, the poor man's covered call is actually a street term for an efficient way to use the covered call. So, uh, Marty, I'm going to turn it over to you and, uh, and have at it, sir. That sounds great, Mark. Thank you very much, and hello, everybody. Uh, I hope you are having a wonderful day. Some of you were watching markets today. They were moving around a little bit. Uh, some of you are getting this on an archive basis, but, uh, but today was a busy day in the option world. Uh, let's talk about a couple of things here. Okay, we're going to talk about something called the poor man's covered call. And before we get into that, we're going to do the, the usual disclaimers. We're, we're not here to give trading advice. Okay, we're not going to use real stocks with real prices because we don't want to make it look like we're, we're telling you what to do or what not to do. Okay, you know, you should talk to your tax advisor. You can talk to your, uh, your financial representative, the, your financial advisor as well. Okay. Uh, leaps are kind of an interesting product. You know, years and years ago, I'm going to give you the history on, uh, on options. Okay, well, look, before I do that, let's do the last uh, of the intro things, okay? Uh, right, this optionseducation.org, you f already found this. Uh, it's a great spot. There's a good uh, webinar coming up next week as well. I'll tell you about that at the very end. Okay, and there are podcasts, and, and these people are here to answer your questions. So if you don't mind... Uh, Sending your question in to Bill Ryan, who's a Chicago White Sox fan. You know, you can contact uh, the OIC, and their objective is to try to get you an answer very, very quickly, if not uh, immediately within the next 24 hours. So they are a wonderful resource. They don't care which brokerage firm you're with. They don't care which exchange the, uh, the order is sent to. They don't have any favorites in that area. They just want to get you the information so you can make your own decision and uh, do well. So here's the idea with options. So when options first started, I mean, they started hundreds of years ago, but the listed options came out in the early 1970s, and the idea there was, I'd like to buy an option on XYZ. Who's going to sell it to me? Well, I'm going to have to have my broker find someone that will give me an option for the number of shares I want on the date that I want with the strike price or the level at which I want to control my stock or, or give away my stock if I'm doing a covered right, and it was kind of cumbersome, and it was, is, is it a good price, right? And now I want to get out of this. You know, I put on a December position going out uh, 90 days. A month from now, I change my mind. I've got to go back to the same person and say, what would you let me out of my trade at, okay? So when, with the idea of standardized options, it became very simple, right? It's, each option is 100 shares. There's a set strike price, maybe the 50 strike price on XYZ. The third Friday of the month, stocks are put into quarterly cycles, and I can buy it from you. I'm really buying it from the Options Clearing Corporation. Okay, so when I decide to sell it, I might be selling it to Mark, okay, or, or Bill Ryan, or Ken, but I'm really selling it back to the Options Clearing Corporation, So because it's a standardized contract, right? Well, and over the years, they've done a few things, right? We've added more strike prices. We've added more expirations. Okay, we've added more stocks to the mix. And in the early 1990s, investors said, well, you know what, I like the idea of three, six, and nine-month options. But in, in my particular case, I'm looking at, at doing something a little differently. I'd like to control the stock for a longer period of time. You know, nine months doesn't do it. All right? Uh, what, what can we go to as a longer setup? So they came out with something called leaps. And all leaps are... For, for the, you know, not to get technical here, but in reality, all they really are is an option with a longer time frame. Okay? So we're going to talk about what we can do with leaps and maybe a way that we can reduce the cost even lower. Rather than owning the stock, owning the, an option would be cheaper. Maybe there's a way to reduce that cost as well. Okay? And we have time at the end for questions and answers. So send those in and... Uh, you know, Ken and Bill and Mark are going to get those questions and kind of filter them through to me so we don't have duplicates, right? And then I will get to those as quickly as we can. We'll have time at the very end, right? So these are the long anticipation securities. This is a big industry for acronyms, right? And uh, they go up to about two and a half years in length at their longest, 
Right now we have options going out to January of 2021, and we are in the process of adding options to January of 2022. It depends on what quarterly cycle your stock was put in. Some stocks are in the uh, January, April, July uh, cycle. Some are in the Feb, May, August. I'm trying to remember these. All right. So the idea here is that as each of these cycles come up, they are going to add a third of the LEAPS eligible stock at a time. And we have uh, our last group is set to be added uh, uh, the week of uh, September 16th. All right, so we will have options out to 2022 and all of the LEAPS eligible stocks after that date. Okay, you can do lots of strategies with LEAPS, but I think the most popular is to buy the LEAP call. Okay, so the idea of owning, a, you already know what the idea of owning a call option is. Whatever I spend for the call option is the most I can lose. If I buy an option for $3, right, that's $3 per share each option, Standardized contract, it's 100 shares, isn't it? So it costs me $300. If this stock goes from, if the stock's near 50 and I'm buying a 50 call and the stock goes from 50 to 20, you know what? I could lose money, but I only put up three bucks, right? I have a right to do something, to buy the stock at a certain price up to a certain date, okay? So there may be a cheaper way to own a stock by owning a call, and maybe there's a, a better way to control the stock for a longer period of time by owning a leaps or long-term option, okay? There's certainly less capital, right? We're down in this uh, second little dot here, required than buying 100 shares of the underlying stock. That makes sense, right? If we take a look at a deep in the money call, it appreciates similar to the share. So for example, like if, if we're looking at a stock trading at uh, $70 per share, if I'm looking at a 70 strike price call option, the delta should be close to about 50, meaning the stock moves from 70 to 71. The option that I you know, own for $3, if it has a delta of 50, it should go from $3 to perhaps close to $350, shouldn't it? Okay? And in the, op in the money option might be uh, along the lines of, right, uh, the stock is at 70, if I own the 65 strike price call, hey, it's intrinsically worth $5, isn't it? But if this stock goes from 70 to 71, that 65 call is now intrinsically worth $6, isn't it? It has a higher delta. It starts to act a lot more like the underlying shares. Okay, and in this example, right, we're saying that a delta of 80 gains approximately 80 cents, right, per $1 if the stock moves up a dollar. Now, conversely, if the stock goes down, a deep in the money option, call or put, would lose pretty much the equivalent, close to 80 cents. Okay? Now, what the idea here is that people that buy you know, short-term calls and puts or sell short-term calls and puts, traditionally, the vast majority of those people close out the position before expiration. Okay? But if you own a leap option, you could certainly sell it back to the market, couldn't you? All right, so I could buy a leap call on XYZ. I could go out two years or whatever the, the time frame is. And three months from now, six months from now, I, I grow weary of owning this particular option, controlling the shares. Okay, I can sell it back into the marketplace. Okay, so that's the idea with the options. That Just like a regular option, if you own a leap option, you can sell it. If you sold a LEAP option, you can always buy it back. Now, there's a couple of other things. This uh, slide on the bottom talks about the dividends, right? But let's go in order here. Yeah, eventually the, this position is going to be managed. If, if you hold on to this until the very last day and the stock that was trading at 70 is now trading at 100 and you own the 70 strike price LEAP's call, it turns into a regular option and then that will in turn be automatically be exercised by your broker, and now you will be the happy owner of 100 shares of stock at $70 per share, okay? Um, the bid ask sometimes. You know, I'm, I'm asked about that occasionally, where if you take a look at a short-term option on ABC or XYZ, you might see that this option is, you know, um, 250 bid offered at 253, right? Or, you know, $3 bid offered at 305. Well, if you get out into the leaps, the longer-term options, you will occasionally see 
that this option going out two or two and a half years isn't as efficient as the underlying stock, the difference between the bid and the ask, or the difference in the bid and ask with the short-term option. So you may see an option that is $6 bid offered at $620. Now, that's still not bad. You know, when, when the options, when the lease options first came out, we were seeing options that were a dollar wide. They were, they were pretty hard for the professionals to price, and, and much less individual investors price what is this option worth going out two years, right? But the bid ask can be just a little bit wider than you're used to. So what I tell people is, I have no objection whatsoever. I have traded leaps. Believe me, I have traded leaps. I don't buy a leap on, you know, that we're, film, we're filming this. We're taping this on a Wednesday. I don't buy a leap option today with the idea that I'm go- going to get out of it on Friday, right? Because look at the bid ask on that option. You know, it could be six bid at 620. If I go in even at 605 or 610, I still might have the same problem with a wide market when I'd like to exit the position, okay? So you can get not great execution prices if you're using a leaps option as a short-term instrument. You might be better off using a shorter-term instrument than using a leap option. But if you're using a leap call option as a stock substitute, maybe your maybe your view is a little longer term. I'm, I'm going out six months a year, two years, two and a half years, okay? Uh, when we take a look at... Um, Higher strike calls are cheaper, have more time value. Yeah, you know, what, what we're looking at there is out-of-the-money options are always cheaper but st- than, than at-the-money options or in-the-money options. But once again, you've got a year, two years, two and a half years to make this work. So you might take a look at that $70 stock and you, you might say, hey, I could buy a 90-strike price call going out to January of 2022. Okay, so hopefully the Chicago Bears are in the Super Bowl. Okay, well, the problem is, is that, yeah, but it's out of the money, isn't it? Stocks at 70, I'm looking at the 90 call, but it's got two and a half years of life. Okay, so they have more time value. Okay, and lower strike calls are, they seem a little bit more expensive, right? Because, number one, they are closer to at the money or they're in the money, but they also have that great time value. We're still looking at you know a year, two and a half years until they expire. Now, one of the deals with leaps options is this: you control the underlying stock just like you would a regular option. But even though you control the stock for a year or two, you do not get voting rights. Okay, you cannot be invited to the annual uh, meeting and you know wherever it is, Omaha or Bentonville, Arkansas, or wherever your company is that you're buying these leaps options on, right? You do not get dividends. Now, there are some stocks that don't pay dividends, right? Some of the tech stocks don't pay dividends. Some of the newer stocks uh, don't pay dividends, right, the IPO stocks. Uh, But there are other stocks that do pay dividends. Well, you know what you'll find that's kind of interesting? If you own a LEAPS option on a stock that pays a dividend, that particular LEAP option might appear cheaper than a similarly priced stock with a similar implied volatility. Now we're getting into some of the Greeks here, okay? Uh, With a stock that does pay a dividend or does not pay a dividend, the reason being that, you know, when that stock pays the dividend, the stock is moved down by the ex-dividend amount. So just a quick review, stocks at 70, if it pays a 25 cent dividend, it closed at 70 today, all right? If it pays a 25 cent dividend tonight, if it goes ex-dividend, what that means is shareholders now own 100 shares of XYZ that's trading at 69.75 should it open unchanged tomorrow morning from its closing price and there's a check in the mail for 25 cents isn't there so everybody is is good on this the person that owned the stock the stock has moved down a little bit but they have a check coming okay the deal with someone that owns a leap option is guess what now you owned a an option on a stock trading at 70, and tomorrow the stock's trading at 69.75, isn't it? These are figured into the option pricing. You know, by, by an options pricing calculator, your broker has one, the options industry council has one, okay, that you can use. And you can plug in, does the stock pay a dividend? And you can get into the pricing of that particular option. When we take a look at time decay, all options 
decay pretty much every day. Now, theta or time decay is one of the different variables with option pricing, right? We have, you know, what is the price of the stock, which strike price, uh, what are interest rates going lower at this point in time, is there a dividend, you know, if so, what is the dividend amount, okay, and the time involved. And every day we hold on to this, and, and with the Greeks, what they say is, you know, we're, we're changing one variable. In this case, let's just, the stock stays the same, interest rates stay the same, but one day happened here, okay? If you own a 30-day option, you now own a 29-day option, don't you? You know, if you own a leap option, you know, going out to whenever, it, it, it was a 560-day option, now it's a 559-day option, isn't it, okay? But time decay happens every day, Okay. This is kind of an interesting slide when, when, when you talk about options. You know, one would think if you're new to options, well, you, you, you would be thinking, well, if a 30-day option is trading at, uh, in this particular case, $1.14, what would a 60-day option trade for? Okay, it's the same stock, it's the same underlying, there's no dividend, okay? You would think, well, you know, would it trade for twice as much? Not necessarily so. You know, T take a look at the uh, take a look at the 20 strike price. I think that's the strike price I wanted to take a look at here. You know, that 20 strike price, that options trading for 93 cents. If we triple this, if we go out to 75 days, the 75 day option is trading at a dollar 81, isn't it? Here's where it's kind of interesting. If you buy the the 20 day option, okay, down at 93 cents, and nothing happens for 20 days, you just lost 93 cents, didn't you? If I buy the 75-day option at $1.81 and nothing happens for 55 days, that option is now a 20-day option, isn't it? It's now worth 93 cents. Look at that. You know, there's more time decay in the 20-day option, you know, trading for 93 cents, than there is in the 75-day option trading at $1.80. What does this mean for us today? What this means is this. If you buy a longer-term option, there is time decay. But you know what? It doesn't really, you know, we saw that on the last graph, didn't we, with the, with the I'm going to back up a slide here, if that's all right. Right? Whoops, wrong one. I want to go this way. Here we go. Yeah, you know, it, we're way over here. We're kind of off the edge of the screen here, okay? There is a little what we call vertical displacement in nautical terms, all right? But not very perceptible. It is there, but... You, you really hardly even notice it. So what that means is only term option, at least initially, doesn't hurt you as much with time decay that a short-term option does. So let's take a look at the traditional covered call, okay? Pretty simple. The traditional covered call says this. I'm going to buy 100 shares of an underlying stock, and I'm going to sell a call option against it. Now, it doesn't have to be si simultaneously. Okay, I bought 500 shares of a stock today. I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to tell you what stock I bought, but I got a very good price on it. Okay, I intend to sell call options against this in the very near future. I think this stock may bounce a little bit more than it did from where I bought it. Should that happen, I would like to sell call options against it. I am not married to this particular stock. Okay, so you will do this simultaneously. That's called a buy right, B-U-Y, and then right, W-R-I-T-E, or it's just a covered call, right? So the idea here is simple. I'm selling an option, letting someone have the right to take the stock away from me, but in this case, I, the traditional way is I own the underlying shares. If you'd like to take this away from me, you've got it. This was the first strategy I ever did. I worked for a company. I had a real job many years ago, and I was buying shares of the company stock. I sold what we what we know as out of the money options. The stock was about 35. I still remember my first trades. I sold the 40 strike price calls. Going out a month, six weeks, someone had the right to take the stock away from me at 40. They paid me a premium for that. Okay, if you want it at 40, you can have it. I've got more. Okay, the options expired worthless. I got to keep my stock. I got to keep the premium. You know, some people do the, the covered call as saying this is a target price where I don't mind losing the stock, as I plan to do on the shares that I bought today. Some people just say, you know what, this is just a good way to bring in some revenue. 
Okay, bring in a little extra premium. You know, I have the stock, I'm getting a dividend, I'm, I'm getting some premium. I don't really hope to lose the stock, but if it happens, it happens. Okay, and you can always buy the option back if you want to. Okay, as long as you're not assigned, right, you can buy that option back at some point. So the, the primary goal here is I'd like to receive some money and, right, maybe keep the stock. Maybe not, but in, in, if I do, it's called away at a higher price. So I get the, the movement up in the stock. That gain plus the dividend, okay, uh, and the, the premium that I got from selling the particular option, okay. So the investors forecast neutral to, to bullish. You know, I think you're. I, I think a better term might be neutral to moderately bullish. You know, if I think uh, I've, if I've got a stock trading at fifty dollars and I sell a fifty-five strike price call, I don't think it's going to seventy dollars before expiration thirty days from now, okay. I think there's a very good chance that this stock could be up 5 or 10%. You know, we go up 10% from 50, we're up close to 55, right? And that's where I have an obligation to sell a stock, but I got paid for it, okay? So the people that do the, the covered right, if, if you're not bullish on a stock, don't. this is not the strategy for you, okay? Uh, but the idea with the covered call is, guess what? I'm selling something traditionally out of the money, you know, higher that the call I'm using is higher than the current stock price uh, that I currently have, but I'm covered. Okay, so a covered writer, I have an obligation at the strike price that I choose, uh, up until the expiration that I choose, if I am assigned. Okay, now assignment can happen at any time before expiration. Okay, all individual stocks and ETFs are what we call American-style options. What that means is I can be called away at any point in time for any reason. Now, how often does that happen? Not that often. Not that often before expiration, except, now think about this, if there's a dividend. You know, if I sell that 50 call, and, and I'm sorry, I own the stock at 50, I sell the 55 call, and the stock headed up to $60. This doesn't happen a lot in my life, but, but it has happened, okay? Well, you know what? The stock goes ex-dividend tomorrow. And there are usually professionals out there that are saying, hey, if I exercise that 55 call I own, remember I sold them the 55 call, right? I did the covered, right? If I exercise the 55 call, I get to collect the dividend, don't I? All right, so I own the stock. I can take it away from Marty and I would collect the dividend, okay, rather than wait until expiration to exercise this. So they're doing the math on this. Am I better off waiting until expiration? Am I better off exercising tonight and collecting the dividend? So you do not control whether you are assigned. What you have to remember is this. If you do a covered right, it is imperative that you know, does the stock pay a dividend? What is the dividend amount? And when does the stock go X dividend? I don't care where when the record date is. I don't care when the payable date is. You know, the computers will handle it. My my broker's computers are wonderful. They'll they'll figure it out, right? I would just like to know as as a person that has a trade on, when does the stock go X dividend? Because that might move my thinking a little forward to make a decision. What would I like to do with this? Hey, I don't want to lose the stock. Maybe I'll buy back the option. Well, it's, the option's a little expensive. Yeah, but the stock's done very well. It's moved up, hasn't it? Okay. We'll see an example of that. Maybe I'll roll it out to a different uh, expiration or a different um, strike price. Okay. But you should know if you do the covered right, does the stock pay a dividend? When is the ex-dividend date? When you do the covered call, your potential is limited. Right. It's limited up to the point where you sold that strike price, and you get to collect the premium. You get that's yours to keep. Okay, but you do not participate in stock participation above them, th that level because, sure, the stock goes up and you own the stock, but you're sure to call that's in the money now, isn't it? Okay, you have to figure out where your break-even point is. Well, your break-even point is, you know, if I sell a 50 call and I bring in a dollar j just for fun, the stock is trading at 50 and I sell a 50 call, I collect a dollar, well, my break-even is 49, isn't it? Right? the stock goes down, hey, I get to keep the dollar premium, okay? If the stock goes from 50 to 45, well, this didn't work out real well. I still own the stock. It's down $5 on paper, right? I got to keep a dollar, 
But on paper, I'm still down $4, aren't I? So the downside loss potential can be pretty substantial on a covered right. You're not doing a covered right to protect yourself. Okay, this does not protect you. You get to bring in premium, which is great, okay, but it does not protect you. Whatever protection it is, is the premium you received. So here's a pretty typical covered call. Here's XYZ trading at 52. Yeah, you want 100 shares, all right? I kind of like the stock right here. I think it's going to stay here, maybe drift a little bit higher over the next, you know, whatever time frame this is. It's, the time frame is really not important, for example. And you know what? I'd like to sell the 55 strike price call and collect $1.75. So do I have a right or an obligation? Well, I have an obligation, and the obligation is, if called upon to do so, I have to deliver 100 shares at $55 per share. I have $1.75 of protection. Do you see how here, if, this, if the stock heads from 52 down to 50, Okay, yeah, I lost $2 on the stock, but you know what? The, the 55 call expired worthless. I got to collect $1.75. I'm still down a quarter, okay? At 45, you can see the, the, the downside of the covered call. It really doesn't protect me. But if the stock heads up to 55, hey, I'm up $3 on the stock I own. 55 call just expired worthless. I get to keep the $1.75. I'm up 475 But as you can see over in that right column, as we move a little higher there, when we get the stock up to 60, it doesn't get any better. My profit potential doesn't get any better because the call I have sold is working against me, isn't it? So I make money on the stock, I lose the equivalent amount on the call option I have sold. Okay, the dotted line here, or the dashes, whatever we want to call that, that's long stock. Yeah, you own it at 52. If the stock goes to 53, you're up a buck. Stock goes from you know, 50 to, I'm sorry, yeah, at 50 there. No, it's at 52, right? If the stock goes from 52 to 53, you make a buck. If it goes from 52 to 51, you lose a buck, okay? Your potential is theoretically unlimited to the upside, okay? And you have risk of owning the stock all the way down to zero. The covered call, you still have that risk because this is not protecting us, remember? But my break-even has been moved over from that previous slide to 50 and a quarter because I collected $1.75. I do much better on the way up for a while. The point of indifference, right, where the solid blue line and the horizontal line crosses the dashes there is 56.75, isn't it, right? The 55 strike price plus the $1.75 I collected. So anything below 56.75, the covered call does better, okay? So you, we know where our break even is. This is a good example of what the covered call looks like, kind of in a graphic form, okay? So let's talk about the poor man's covered call. You know, I looked at, I've got a couple of watch lists that I take a look at. You know, one is, is my stocks that I have, another is, is stocks that I might be taking a look at. A third one is uh, a particular money manager that, that sends me his picks that I, I take a look at and, you know, kind of look over his shoulder, okay? And I don't get to see when he gets in and out of stocks, but every week or so he sends me an update. This is what I have right now, and this is what the price I bought it at. And you know what I found? This was kind of interesting. I had There was one list I was looking at. There were 23 stocks, I believe, I was looking at. And I want to say 13 of the 23 had stocks trading for over $100 a share. And you know what happens here? Years ago, um, I, I, I was trading back when you know the earth was cooling and dinosaurs ruled the earth, okay, uh, as a floor trader. You know, when stocks used to get up to sixty, eighty, a hundred dollars, they'd split two for one, wouldn't they? Okay, and all of a sudden, instead of owning a hundred shares at a hundred dollars, you own two hundred shares at fifty. Stocks don't seem to split anymore. All of a sudden, we're getting a good number of stocks that are trading at one hundred, two hundred, four hundred, eight hundred dollars a share. Okay, the stocks don't split anymore. So you can do the covered call, but but one of the problems is you don't have as, to me, as many candidates as I'd like to do. Right. Because if I buy a, a, um, 100 shares of a stock at $300 a share, you know what, what is it, $30,000? I, I, don't, I don't throw $30,000 around like manhole covers, okay? Um, so the idea here is let, let's just go down this left column in the covered call. The, the traditional covered call, you're neutral to moderately bullish, right? I'm going to buy 100 shares of stock at the top there. I'm going to sell in near term. In near term, term could be two or three weeks, maybe a month, month and a half. 
I don't like to do the covered call. This is just me here. Marty, safety tip number 31 of the day here. I don't like to do covered calls for more than 60 days. Why is that? I want time to work for me. Remember we talked about that time decay early on about the the 20 day or the 75 day option. I'd like to sell something closer in time that that time decay, that sound I hear coming out of the New York Stock Exchange or the other exchanges is time decay. All right. So I'm neutral to moderately bullish. Uh, this it's the substantial is upfront capital. It's 100 shares, isn't it? My upside profit is limited if I do the covered call. I'm, I'm going down the left column here, up to the strike price. You know, plus the premium I got for selling it. My downside rich, risk substantial, right? I brought in premium, but I have I have the risk of the stock getting clobbered. Assignment risk, absolutely, right? The stock could certainly be called away. All right, now that may be good, that may be bad. All right, maybe as the stock gets closer to the strike price, I should decide am I okay with letting the stock go, or should I close the position or trade it in for a different one? You know, what's our break-even point? Well, it's the stock price that I bought it at. You know, less whatever premium, whatever I collected for selling the call option against it. Now, if I take a look at the leaps option, I've gotten the 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 question, why is it, if I buy one, why is it a leaps and not a leap, right? It's a long-term equity anticipation security, okay? So back to the acronyms again, right? So I'm going to buy a leaps call option. Well, that's good. Now I control the stock for an extended period of time. But we're going to talk about selling an option against it, maybe to lower the price of that leaps long-term option. So in this case, I'm still neutral to moderately bullish, Right? I don't want the stock to go to the moon right away because I have an obligation to let it go. Right? Your upfront capital, while substantially reduced, it's substantially reduced from owning the underlying shares. Right? So if you're looking at a stock at $80, you have to put up 8000 If you buy a leaps call, maybe you put up 7 or 8 Okay. But if I'm doing a covered right against that, maybe I'm bringing in a dollar or two. Okay? So maybe I'm only putting up 5 or 6 Okay, so certainly less than owning the underlying shares. Downside risk is substantial, right? If I buy a leaps call option and I sell something shorter term against it and this stock gets completely clobbered, I can lose money. But you know what? It's not going to be the dollar amount. The percentage amount could, would certainly has the possibility of being much higher, right? The percentage of money I lost on the trade, but the dollar amount is a lot less than owning the underlying shares. There is assignment risk, okay? I'll talk to you about this at the very end, okay, the, the, the settlement rules, okay? My break-even price is pretty simple. It's whatever the leaps call option cost me to buy, less the premium I brought in by selling the short-term option. Keep in mind also that as I'm saying this, we're not, we're not bringing into account the uh, uh, whatever transaction costs or commissions are involved, okay? Uh, but I do want to bring that up. Somebody remind me at the very end about the substitution. Make a little note to myself. Right. So there's no hard and fast rule to, to get involved with this leap option. Okay. But what we're looking at here is rather than buy the stock, I'm going to buy a leap option. Well, one of the things I could certainly look at is the Greeks that I could find on my broker's website or here at uh, the Options Industry Council. I'm buying what the screen says is a deep in the money call option with a delta greater than 75. Well, you know what? My rule of thumb is 70-ish or higher. 70 to 75 works out. Okay. What does that mean? That if the stock, if I buy this leap option and the stock starts to move higher, I have an option that if we use the 75 delta, the stock moves up a dollar tomorrow. Theoretically, my option should try to tag along for at least 75 cents of that, shouldn't it? So I want an option that kind of mimics the stock, you know, on the, especially on the upside. And as the stock continues higher, that delta increases, doesn't it? You know, maybe from, you know, 50 to 51, the, the, it's, it's, a, it's a 75 delta, and 51 to 52, it's an 80 delta, okay? So now it's, it acts like 80 uh, shares of stock, right, from 51 or from 52 to 53. So I'm looking for near-term options to sell against it. And what this has, says here is I'm looking for options with less than a 30 delta. That makes sense to me. I, I might even be looking for something a little bit less, 25 to 30 cents or less than that. Okay? Why? I don't want the stock to get above my strike price necessarily. Okay? You can certainly look for low volatility 
or low beta stocks, right? Low beta, you know, how will this stock do compared to the market? Low volatility, there's, by the way, next week's uh, webinar is going to be on high volatility, okay? And you'll be able to ask uh, Jay Soloff about uh, some high volatility trades next week, okay? But the idea here is I'd like to buy something that acts, I'd like to buy a leap that acts like the stock. I'd like to sell something out of the money with a low delta, okay? Right? So it, it, looking for a stock that fits all of the above could be the pink unicorn, absolutely, okay? But you get the you get the drift. of At least if that's your starting point, then you can say, well, you know, here, Marty said 70 to 75. I looked up a stock here, and in, in, uh, I'm not going to tell you the stock, but I looked up a uh, delta on a leaps option for a stock, and the, and the, uh, the delta was 69.97, okay? You know what? That's... that's as we say, that's close enough for government work, isn't it? Okay, this particular leaps option had a delta. It's a 70 delta, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so you have to f decide what your parameters are, and then adjust accordingly. Okay, so here's the setup, right? Here's Nicholas, push on Bubble, the famous Bubble company. All right, make uh, soft drinks. He's been thinking about selling a covered call, but you know what? The stock's trading for 82 bucks. Kind of. Expensive. You know, maybe he could only do one contract, right? Buy 100 shares and sell one contract against it. He's got $8,000 tied up on this thing, okay? Uh, maybe he should consider this, right? With $8,200 of, of risk in this thing, instead, why doesn't he do this? Why doesn't he buy a 70 call option going out to January of 2021? So this is the traditional expiration, the third Friday in January, Okay. And that option, you can see the bid ask there. Remember, I told you that some of the bid ask can be a little wide. In this case, it's twenty cents wide. You know, the, the difference between the bid price and the offer price. And let's just assume he pays the offer price. Okay, he would pay thirteen sixty. So what does he have? He has the right to own the stock at eighty dollars. I'm sorry, he has the right to own the stock at seventy dollars per share. It's already trading at eighty two, isn't it? Well, you know what? That option is $12 in the money. That's got a nice delta, doesn't it? Got a delta of 83, meaning if the stock goes up from 82 to $83 tomorrow, this option should go from 1360, maybe the offer would be 1440, right? Somewhere in that general area, 1445. Okay? Uh, but the idea here is th there's a couple of things here. One, this option seems pretty cheap going out a year and a half. You know what? I would bet that this particular bubble stock pays a dividend. Okay, you know maybe it's only twenty-five or thirty cents a quarter, but you know what? Those are kind of nibbling away at you know that stock tomorrow. If the, if it went ex dividend tonight, the stock would be at eighty-one seventy-five, wouldn't it? If it was a twenty-five cent dividend. So once again, there's reasons that that these options look cheap, and there's a reason, and, and that could be what this is. But short term, I still think $1,360, $1,360, certainly less than putting up $8,200 to buy 100 shares, right? Certainly a lot less than that. I'd like to lower it down even further. Why don't I sell a short term of November? We're going out, what, about 75 days here now, okay? Uh, 75, 80, 85 days here. Why don't I sell a short-term 85 strike price call against that and collect? In this case, the bid is two dollars and 18 cents. So, so what do I have here? And, you know, at the end of the day, let's try to figure out what I have here, right? I have the right to buy 100 shares of bubble at 70 dollars between now and the third Friday in January. Okay, I have an obligation. By selling an option, I have an obligation between now and the third Friday in November of this year to deliver 100 shares at $85 per share. This is considered covered. Now, and we're not doing transaction costs here, okay? Here's what you have to remember. If you do a covered right, your broker, probably you are set up that everything, everything is good here, right? You own the shares. You're doing a covered right against it. No problem. You're approved to do that. But you know what? Most brokers take a look at this as not owning an equity, not owning a long-term equity anticipation security. They're saying, look, Marty owns an option, or in this case, uh, who was it? Larry or somebody, right? Who was it? Nicholas. 
Nicholas owns a long-term option and Nicholas has sold a short-term option. You have to make sure that you are approved by your broker to do a spread transaction. Okay? I don't think this would be a problem for almost all of you, but you have to get this worked out with your broker ahead of time. Hey, instead of buying the stock, I'd like to buy a leaps call option. I'd like to sell something short-term against it. Okay? Then you and, and he or she or they can decide, you know, is this appropriate for your particular condition? Okay? So I'm basically substituting the stock that I could have bought by buying a Leafs option against it. Okay? So I paid thirteen fifty, I collected two twenty. Okay? You know what? My net risk is eleven thirty, so at one thousand one hundred and thirty dollars, still less than the eighty two hundred I was risking. I don't think the stock's going to zero, right? But still you're risking a lot less. And and that's the idea with using options to your benefit. You know, how how can I bring in a little extra premium? How can I reduce my risk? Okay? The total covered call, right, is eighty two hundred less two hundred and twenty dollars, I'd have to put up seventy nine eighty, okay, and either put it all up in cash or do it on a margin account. Okay. But the idea here is what is my risk? What what am I trying to do here? Well, what I'm trying to do is have that short term option expire. Right? If you're doing a covered call, you might be like me saying, take that terrible stock away from me at some point that I'm thinking of doing the covered write on. Okay, but in this case, I don't own the underlying shares. Okay, so I might have to do something to adjust this should the stock do very, very well and get up to that 85 strike price or get a little better. So at the inception, what am I looking at here, right? 8,200 on the stock, okay, right? Uh, we're looking at the value of the leaps call, the short call against it, okay? Um, and what happens if the stock now heads down? Right, we're trading at 82, but look at the top of the page here. You're managing the trade. The stock actually went down seven dollars. Well, boy, that's not working. Okay, if I own the stock outright, I'd be down seven. Okay, if I owned the, if I just did the covered call, sure, I would have brought in 220, but I'm still down almost five dollars, aren't I? Okay, uh, with a week until expiration, what we're looking at here is. Uh, this is a an estimated value. Look at that right column under the 75. It says 795. What we're looking at there is using a pricing calculator that says, look, with the stock at $75, X number of days until expiration, I'm looking at this particular strike price. Okay, theoretically, what should this option be worth? Now, I haven't taken into account, you're right, you know, interest rates or uh, changes in volatility. Maybe the volatility went higher, okay, because the stock is moving around a lot, okay? But the idea here is that this position could work against me. Even though the option that I sold expires worthless, okay, and I collected $220, I'm still down $335. Okay, so using the leaps with a short-term out-of-the-money call option collecting the premium, the poor man's covered call, that's what that PMCC is, if you're confused, okay, you know what? I lost $335. Now, Percentage-wise, that's a lot, isn't it? 30% 30, 30 on, on the initial investment. But still, I'm only down $335. The stock's down seven, I'm down 335. This isn't working right now, but you know what? I still control the stock for how many more days? You know, how, how many months, how many years did this option have as a, a lifetime at the beginning here, okay? The stock's at 85, well, guess what? All is well, right? The stock went up in value, Okay, that's great. My leap went up in value. Okay, it went from thirteen fifty, maybe up to close to sixteen. Went up about two and a half bucks, maybe a little bit less. Okay, why? It's got a pretty nice delta on it, doesn't it? Stock went up three. My option only went up. What do we say here? Two forty. That's okay. It had a delta of eighty initially. Okay, what's this uh, short call worth? Well, what we're saying here is, hey, look, we're expiration week here. That short call option. It's worth something. We've got a week to go until expiration. It's worth something. Maybe this is where I want to close that position out. Okay? So look what happened here. The net net is if this stock runs to 85 with a week to go, I'm up 35% on my initial investment. You know, if you buy a stock at 82 and it goes to 85, it's three bucks. You're going to have to help me with the math on that. You know, what is that? You know, 4%, 3%. 
three and a half, four percent, that that's pretty nice. Okay, I'd take that. But you know what? Using the leaps as a substitute and, and offsetting it with selling an out of money call, you're doing even better. Okay? Stock goes to ninety, this is where our problem happens, right? You've got to decide how am I going to do this? Because you don't have stock to deliver, right? You're probably going to have to buy back the call, all right, and then sell a 90 or 95 option going out 30 days if you want to lower that cost. You did well with the stock and the leaps call. You're not losing money, but you're not making money up there. Okay? And I'm going to back up here for a second. The other thing that happens is this. Let's just say that the stock goes to 90. Okay, this isn't in your slides here, but, but close your eyes and listen. All right, The stock goes to 90, and you wake up one day, and you get a little notice from your broker, either by phone or by text or, or by an email, saying, hey, Marty, congratulations, you were just assigned on your short 85 strike price call. Your new position is you own a leaps call right? that's deep, deep in the money. All right, You own the 70 call, the stock's at 90, it's $20 in the money. <clears throat> Excuse me. But you're also short 100 shares of stock. Well, the easiest thing I think you could do is buy back the stock, sell something against it, you know, reinitiate the position with owning the leaps call and maybe being short a 95 strike price call for December. Okay? Or maybe you just maybe you just buy back the stock and now you own the leaps call outright. Hey, the stock's doing even better than I expected. I'm going to let this thing run for a while. I don't want to do the covered call. Okay? So strange things can happen to this, but it requires a little bit of work on your part to figure out how do I adjust this, right? And, and as, as I'm getting close to, to that expiration of that short term, what's my new objective here? You know, where do I think the stock's going from here, okay? What kind of position do I have, right? Do I have to modify this, okay? You can certainly do that. That's easy to do, okay? You could let the short leg expire. That's what a lot of people would certainly like. I don't have to pay any commission to my broker, right? If the market moves against me, you have to, don't be looking at this as, you know, just an outright option position with a lot of life to it, how do I feel about the stock? You know, if that stock went from 82 to 75, sure, I own a leaps option, okay? And I'm down 300 and some dollars. But do I really like the stock, okay? Or is the stock starting to break down? And if you would say, I don't like the stock, get out of the option. Get out of the leaps option, okay? All right, if the market moves too high, guess what? You can roll a position, okay? If you're assigned, you can buy the stock back, Talk to your broker. Make, make sure you're all on the same page on this, right? But you can buy the stock back and then either do nothing and just own the leap call or you can sell something against it to try to lower the price. Okay? So we've, we've got these education programs for you. And as I said, next week, uh, Jay Soloff is going to talk about uh, high volatility trades. Uh, for those that are watching this on an archive basis, uh, today was kind of a high volatility day. Okay? You can look back on the on the 14th, okay, but maybe Jay can give you some good ideas as to how to how to how to handle that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've got our contact information there up on the screen right now. Certainly makes use of our investor services team. Again, investor services, you can reach us at options at the OCC.com. We'll be happy to answer uh, all of your options-related questions. Hope to see you next week. Again, thank you for joining us today, Marty. As always, it's been wonderful. Uh, ladies thank and gentlemen, you. have a terrific day, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you, everybody.